Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with another episode of What's On Your Mind. I'm Chris Quill, and today I'm joined by Raj Malhotra and Ben Green. And gents, it's fantastic to have you both back on the show. Um, let's get stuck into it in terms of, you know, what you guys have been thinking about the current kind of markets and also what you're thinking in terms of ideas for your own portfolios. Uh, ben, let's kick it off with you today. Yeah, hi, guys. Good morning uh, from the West Coast here. I have two uh, ideas I want to talk about. These are both sort of macro driven um, that I'm looking at because, you know, right now in this environment is very, very macro oriented. Uh, but bef- so before I get into the real company specifics, um, let's just have a look at the current drivers of the market these days. And unless you've been living under a rock, it's clearly the inflation problem we're having. All right, so here's the CPI index going back 12 months. And um, it's obviously not a secret that the Fed has been really cranking the rates higher and they basically have the emergency brakes on to try to get this under control. All right, so the rates are at a vicious pace being raised higher. um, And we're gonna see what they're gonna do here in a little bit because we're recording this actually a couple hours before the FOMC meeting. So obviously, a lot of the data that we talk about might change dramatically over the next couple of days. So, you know, keep that in mind. So anyway, the CPI had a reading in, uh, the, the latest reading was, uh, wasn't too bad. It was 8.3% in August, but that was still higher than expectations. Um, but in June, it was over 9%. Okay, and that was the highest it's been in 40 years. And uh, this has just caused havoc across the markets um, and really just dramatic increase in uh, volatility and uh, all kinds of problems, especially in high growth uh, area. So, you know, we're going to see what happens here in a little bit, but um, I kind of use this data as the initial uh, catalyst, if you will, for my first trade idea. So, if, if you look at the CPI number, you can look at this table, uh, it's easy to find online, where to break it down by categories. And you can see that the food and energy space are at the top, not a big shock, okay? But when you break it down into subcategories, we see more specifically that cereal and bakery products um, had an increase over 16% year over year. And right? that's double the headline number plus it was also up in July uh, to August on a monthly basis, contrary to energy that was down sharply. So with that in mind, we're gonna have uh, some uh, quantitative filtering going on. We're gonna see how we can uh, use this data to kind of put it all together in the process. <clears throat> so we use the ITPM data sheets a lot to come up with trade ideas where we use quantitative filtering. And in this case, I'm looking at the um, food manufacturing space. So just to filter this based on the cereal categories, just too narrow, okay? So we're looking at the food manufacturing space, sorting it by fiscal year PE, uh, high to low. What we're looking for here are high PE outliers, meaning that uh, stocks with a very, very high growth expectations over other stocks. And typically there's a reason for that. And when we do that, we see on this table that post uh, actually sits on top, which is also uh, a serial, co- you know, it's a serial company. So it fits into that whole kind of serial category. Uh, and if you look to the right, you'll see that the revenue and earnings growth were, uh, well, they were red going into green for fiscal year two. So this is a situation where things are improving fundamentally at uh, top and the bottom line. And that's what price, you know, stock price keys in on. It's not necessarily if a company is doing well or poorly right now, is if it's getting better or worse. Um, so Pulse, you know, Holdings is a $5.2 billion market cap breakfast cereal company. Um, it operates through five segments. You have uh, post-consumer brands, which is by far the biggest, Witabix, food service, refrigerated retail, and bell ring brands. And uh, for those of you not living in the U.S., Post is basically the cereal brand uh, to go to here. Right. So 
let's uh, let's dig a little bit further into uh, what's going on under the hood. And uh, we're seeing, what we're looking at here is the consensus earnings per share revisions trend for the next four quarters. And uh, you can see that that is being revised higher over the past one and uh, three month basis. And that's following a nice beat uh, on, on both top and bottom lines for last quarter. And additionally, on September 3rd, the board announced a $300 million buyback program that's on a cash basis. And uh, that's always nice to see. So, you know, they have expanded nicely. Uh, they have been active in the MA market in the past. But the last couple of years, the growth have primarily been uh, mostly organic, which is good. And they also have very solid balance sheets, uh, high liquidity, and the debt is uh, easy to manage here. So, so you know, just kind of chugging along, I always like to look at the chart to kind of put it all in perspective. So uh, we're going to have a look at that next, see uh, what that can tell us. This is a weekly chart, okay, going back five to six years. Uh, I have the. I like to have the trailing, the 12 month trailing earnings per share overlaid on top of the chart, just to kind of put it all in perspective. And uh, and it's pretty obvious here that technically the stock is in a longer term uptrend. Uh, it broke out of that 80 level back in June, and uh, it's now sitting near its highs. So, you know, that by itself might not be that big of a deal, but when you consider that the rest of the market has been falling like a rock all year. Uh, it's actually pretty remarkable, right? So what typically happens though under these circumstances is that the stock kind of stalls out, takes a breather. Uh, you can kind of get this congestion phase to last for a month or so. Um, so we're going to, with that knowledge, we're going to reflect that into our option structure. Um, but, you know, with this momentum in earnings and, uh, and uh, bottom line improvements, to see the stock get to 100 and above by by year end is definitely not far fetched, and uh, it can obviously go a lot higher. And uh, a lot of this is going to depend on what happens with the interest rates going forward. So anyway, so you know this is something I'm looking at. I like this idea. Uh, looking at the options chain, um, I am doing this as a one for one calendar uh, call spread. They're not. So these options are not super liquid, okay? Um, but liquid enough. And uh, if you look at the December 85 strike, uh, there's some, you know, decent amount of open interest and the spreads are doable. They're not super narrow, but they're doable, like 10% or less. So I can use that as my, as my long play. And um, I'm looking at buying five lots at 615 each. So that's an outlay of $3,075. So when we go through this math, just uh, you know, take it step by step because it can get a little confusing. So I'm going to do this slowly. Anyway, I also want to sell five of the out of money 90 October strike because remember I said that there's a good chance the stock is going to stall out a bit. You know, it's now at like 86. Uh, it could probably stay below 90 <clears throat> for another month. So we're going to sell the 90 strike for October, hoping that that expire worthless out of the money which gives us a credit on five contracts for $660, which means that the total cost of this trade is $2,415. Um, so let's then presume that the stock does stay below 90, that expires worthless. We keep the credit of 660. So now going into December, we're just long uh, the December calls. Um, and um, and if the stock gets to 100 by then, it will be worth $15, okay? So we paid 615, so it'll be 15 minus 615 is 885, times the, five, times the five contracts, times the 100 multiplier is $4,425. That will be the, you know, the P&L for the long uh, side. Plus we have a credit on the short leg for 660, so the total here then is $5,085, and that's better than a two for one reward risk, which we like to see, right? And, uh, and obviously if the stocks really get cranking after October expiry, uh, you know, gets to 120, 150, there's no limit of how, how, you know, how high a stock can go. 
uh, this structure has unlimited profit potential as well. Uh, now, you know, normally I'll kind of stop at this, but you know, we are in a bear market uh, type of situation, and uh, and, and the, you know the short ter short to medium term outlook for the market is pretty dicey. So I'm going to pair this with a short play, okay? That I'm going to structure, and uh, we're going to discuss that after uh, you know after Rosh's uh, presentation. So, but anyway, this idea could definitely stand on its own, though. Cool, good stuff. Uh, well, with that being said, Raj, let's let's go go over to you and uh, see what you've been thinking about. Yeah, that's uh, hey guys, nice to see you both. Um, and so it's it's interesting, and I agree with you. There's a lot of value names. There's been you know values only thing in play. You know, and one thing I will caution um, uh, retail traders here is you know uh, there's a ton of names out there that look really cheap, particularly even in like retail. Uh, there was a very interesting. Uh, upgrade, a double upgrade earlier this week on home builders, which is a fully contrarian call that kind of points to like the fact that there is value in a lot of these you know, names. It's perceived value, I should say. Um, but for that to be unlocked anytime soon, it's hard for me to see that until sentiment changes. Uh, and even if something is can be in their mind, like home builders are dirt cheap, they can be cheap and they can get cheaper. So it's interesting. It's, I agree with you with names like uh, Post or something with a uh, with inflation that's actually being passed along, or names that are people can see and touch and see that they're actually being consumed versus names that are, you know, like I said, that I have a lot of retail names and I have a list of them that are in my mind that are really uh, inexpensive. But like I said I'm not ready to put a lot of money into them at this point because I'd rather miss the ten. 20% upside if I really think they have 100% upside until we start seeing that. And it's just something we haven't seen yet. But having said all that, in terms of retail, I, there is one name that I really want to pair that with as a short. And this is a name that I really think it's uh, not just a massive to short, it's a massive short and could be worthless uh, in short order. The company is Wayfair. The uh, ticker is a uh, letter W. You don't know what it is, e-commerce company that sells furniture and home goods online. They have bought branded retail websites. Clearly, this company was a big winner from the COVID-19 pandemic and the stimulus tailwind that uh, followed it. But that's clearly subsided in the stock. If you look at the stock, it's down 80 plus percent from its peak. But And the question is where you can go from here. But one thing to keep in mind is don't let big moves scare you because at whatever price can whatever price the stock is, it can still go down 100 percent from where it is. So keep that in mind. That's just mathematics. But let's look at the companies here specifically. Some of the fundamentals. Uh, the stock's trading around 45 bucks as we speak. Uh, the market cap is just under five billion. Uh, the PE is negative, which I'll go through um, more in detail. It's got no dividend yield, and you know this year it's down close to 75 percent. So let's look at Q2 uh, results and then compare them and look, look forward to Q3. So Q, Q2, um, they lost $1.87 per share on revenues to $3.3 billion, which was slightly worse than expectations all around. But more importantly, their revenue year over year uh, in you know Q versus Q2 to 2021, the revenue fell 15%. So that's clearly the wrong direction and going the wrong way. And if you look at... Uh, Earnings, same story. Now, if you look at um, if you, now if you look at Q3, what's what's expected by the market and they report November third, they're expecting a loss of three dollars and thirty two cents. Obviously, much more than the dollar eighty seven they lost last quarter, and two point eight five billion in revenues. Again, going in the wrong direction, both year over year and quarter over quarter. And uh, and this is really in my mind before any of the real uh, pain that may come from a macro recession. So the thesis, I mean, it's pretty clear that uh, the environment now for Wayfair was much worse than it was pre-COVID. Uh, the valuation now is even is clearly outrageous, even at this lower price. Uh, their business is a, 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 it's a first-party e-commerce business, and really the only company that's been successful at that business as a standalone uh, is Amazon. And you know the difference is, you know, Amazon doesn't uh, specialize in one sector. Versus uh, this is in, I'll talk a little more about it, but a sector that clearly is uh, 
not where you want to be, what coming or what may be coming um, in terms of a macro slowdown. So, and also like it's, it, it literally has the worst products for this type of market we're entering, which is big bulky items. And another thing is too, because of, uh, and now that COVID's over, they're seeing clear customer attrition to other companies in this space, whether it's furniture stores that are can physically go to, but even so, even online, they're losing um, market share. If, if you look at the sum of all furniture sales online, so it's being, it's being uh, there's headwinds at every direction in every single way for this company. Um, and, you know, like I said, the macro, macro recession come, you know, this is, versus a tech companies, this is a, a terrible business to be in. Now, looking further under the hood in terms of the numbers, they've had consistently negative EBITDA margins. They have a negative cash burn. They have a negative book value, which right now is about a billion dollars. And they have a huge debt load, which they're going to have to restructure at some point if they're able to do so at all. Now, clearly, the stimulus had a, a rush to buy home furnishings. And as we know, that passing trend, you know, was it's past, it's past, but it was, there's no doubt it was powerful. And, you know, it, even if you look back towards uh, to 2020 and early 21, they actually were able to um, temporarily uh, obtain decent EBITDA margins. And mostly that was due to, Fixed cost dilution, which is basically when they're mostly during advertising. Since you know, if you see, if you have put an ad out and you sell more um, uh, sofas, then you know your even that margin get better because you don't need to double the advertising for amount of sales. But you know that's clearly all past, and they're and they're they're big problems, and their situation is so much worse than pre-pandemic. And by the way, I'm bearish on this back then in the business model. You know, got out during that uh, sugar rush, and now it's. Uh, Something I've had on for a while, but I still continue to like it. Another thing that's interesting is, you know, because of the pandemic, you look at their brand awareness, it's about, eight, by their own admissions, it's about 80% of customers know Wayfair. So, and it was, it was a half, it was about 30 to 40% pre pandemic. So clearly, there's little room for them to grow in terms of obtaining new customers, who never heard of the business. So that's something that broke, uh, a lot of startup growth companies. Uh, bank on, and that's clearly not a uh, that that's something that they can't bank on going forward. And obviously, as we know, inflation you know it's put pressure on home sales and hence home furnishing. So all this in in unison will drive further in my mind further negative EBITDA, net further negative cash free cash flow, and negative equity. The negative equity in the business right now, if you look at it, is about two billion dollars. And when I did my calculations, about it was about one billion dollars pre-COVID. So every every by every metric, even with a one-time, hopefully a one-time world-changing event, um, they're in a worse place. All, they're they're in worse place than they were even with a period of growth of sales that are not repeatable. So like what they're going to have to do is they need to restructure their business. And certainly lay off employees. They started by doing that. They laid off five percent of their employees in uh, August, and but that's not clear enough. And you know, in terms of debt restructuring, that's another story for another day. But I don't want to go into all the details of that right now. But that's uh, that's something that's coming down the road that's going to further weaken their position. Now, if I look at you know, one thing I like to look at is are there any positives or anything they think the company can they can turn this company around and. My own, in my mind, and study this, my, their, their only hope to survive, in my opinion, is basically changing their whole business model and basically transform themselves into a third party marketplace. You know, so th- what that means is basically they're turning themselves into a logistic company and not carrying supply and inventory, but becoming more of an exchange. The best uh, example to compare this to is, is eBay, because eBay is eBay, eBay uh, operates this way, and you know Wayfair is trying to some extent to kind of do the eBay model, uh, but they're not fully committing to it. Versus eBay, which is fully a three part, a third party uh, business. Because if you look at third party business, it can be profitable, it's cheap, and you get a cut of sales of all units of commerce. And they do have a uh, brand na- brand awareness in terms of furniture. If people know furniture online. Um, Wayfair is a place to buy it now but are they going to fully commit to that i seriously doubt that uh, but again unless they fully commit they can't they, they doesn't seem like they're going to do it you know because you know if you look at ebay again they don't hold any inventory 
So the best way to compare this to is uh, if you look at two metrics versus the two. So right now, 72% of Wayfair's businesses come from their products. So to unwind that business, almost impossible. But if you, the best way to compare eBay's business to them is if you look at the amount of um, gross market value, or merchandise value, or GMB, um, and eBay's GMB versus Wayfair's revenues. So if you look at last year, eBay did eight, uh, I'm sorry, if you look at the last 12 months, eBay's done $80 billion of revenues in GMB. And that's six times higher the uh, revenues of Wayfair. So, but so according to that metric, you would think that Wayfair has should have six times less the number of employees of uh, eBay. In fact, they have two times more the employees. So their cost structure is completely out of control and completely out of whack. And for them to actually fully commit to that business model, it would take tremendous commitment and admitting failure from the current uh, management team and. Unless some investor comes, some activist investor from the outside comes in and says, we're going to unwind this whole thing and turn that business into that. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Maybe if the stock was, you know, 80, 90 percent lower from here, maybe they could actually pull that off. But at that point, that's probably where um, I, I would at least be neutral. But right now, I'm still pretty uh, negative on this company. So in terms of structure, like I said, earnings are um, on November 4th. And like I said, I've had this on for a while. I recently restructured this trade um, for a massive profit. So what I did was um, I bought the November 40 puts in a ratio. And by selling the October 42 and a half puts, I'm buying the puts that capture earnings and selling the October puts that miss earnings. Even though we're in a down channel right now, I fully expect uh, this company probably can hang in there for a little bit until uh, earnings. And that's really the tell tell sign that this company is really uh you flush down the toilet so i kind of expected to stay in this range maybe hopefully above 42 and a half before expiration and then sell off aggressively so let's say you had ten thousand to spend um, i had a lot more to spend but i don't want to brag but anyway if you did that you could do it a two to one ratio you could buy 32 of the november puts um for 480 itself 16 of the november puts for three dollars and seventy cents that would get you to around uh, ninety-five hundred dollars. And should the stock uh, get cut in half by November expiration and sell off aggressively, like we expect it could happen, you would make six times your money. And that's only if it gets to there; it could go lower. Uh, but the, the beauty of this trade is, and I don't want to go into every uh, every uh, scenario, but even if the stock did sell off aggressively in October, you would still make a, a lot of money because you're long more than November puts than you're short in the October. Uh, so this trade is somewhat at the timing agnostic. If you wanted to keep it very simple, another structure would be simply to buy the November 40 puts and sell the November 22 and a half puts. Looks like what is we were doing this, you could pay 490 for the November 40s and sell the uh, 22 and a half for 65 cents. So essentially paying four and a quarter to make 13 and a quarter, which is a 3.3 to one risk reward ratio. Um, it's it's a, a very clean way, a uh, very clean structure and uh, pretty easy to understand. So uh, yeah, that's my pitch on uh, Wayfair. Good stuff, good stuff. Uh, ben, we'll go back to you. You mentioned you've got a, a pairing to your initial post idea. So should we talk about that? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. So yeah, Rosh, um... I like that example. The short that I have kind of goes in line with your idea. So uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Before I go into it, I just want to lead kind of with a macro. You know, my, my long idea was macro based based on like CPI inflation. Uh, and this one is uh, kind of the same idea based on some different data, but it's still a, a idea that kind of leads with a macro uh, catalyst. So. Um, this is kind of a, both of these are then tops down based. So if you look at the latest PMI report, okay, from the August ISM, by the way, this report comes out, this report comes out once a month uh, on ismworld.org. They're very useful to kind of break down what's really going on. So anyway, you can see on this, uh, on this chart of the PMI, you know, even though the headline number is 52.8, it's, uh, which is, you know, technically still show an expansion. But, you know, if you look at this chart, you can see how it's been falling 
for, uh, well, since end of 2021. Okay, so the PMI has been falling in line with the market action. Um, this is kind of how this works. If we look further into this report, we can see that this, the seven industries that are uh, in contraction in August, okay, compared to July, they are wood products, uh, apparel, furniture and related products, uh, paper and chemical, uh, fabricated metals and electrical uh, equipment, appliances and components. So when you look at these, question is, what do these have in common? Well, besides apparel and maybe electrical equipment, these are all tied to the construction and building space. You know, so uh, kind of like what Raj was alluding to about uh, you know home furniture uh, space being in contraction. This kind of takes that same <laughs> approach, but just casts a little bit wider net. Um, and also, if you look at the new uh, home sales, there's other you know uh, housing data supporting this. But if you look at the most recent home sales data, it's pretty obvious that the housing market is pulling off and uh, higher mortgage rates that's we're seeing is like, this has been really the icing on the cake here. So uh, now they're like Ralph was saying, there could be, you could argue that, okay, there's value in the, you know, in housing stocks, that might be the case for, uh, you know, long-term investors. However, we're looking at options over the next like one to three months timeframe. Uh, and in that case, usually better off staying with the trend, which is what I'm going to do here, right? So not even all that, um, you know, the home, home building sector is on thin ice. How can we, you know, how can we benefit from that? So what I did is that I, you know, I, I, I went back to the metrics that we use to uh, try to do some quantitative filtering here. And I was looking at the house painting space. Okay, it's all based on the previous data. And I filtered for negative forward revisions in earnings and revenue estimates. That's always kind of a warning flag because it's not that common to have negative in both of these. Okay. Uh, and these stocks, I come up with these three stocks, uh, SHW, PPG, and AXTA. And, uh, and uh, what's interesting too is that they all, all of these stocks have uh, fiscal year growth SMS being cut dramatically. Well, in the SHW, Chevron Williams been cut in half, actually. And uh, if you then, uh, <clears throat> what I then do, I was just say, okay, well, we have three stocks that might look interesting. You know, which ones of these do you look at? Well, obviously we can look deeper into the fundamentals of each, but before you even get to that point, I put them in a trade station radar screen because I want to look at the options liquidity because there's no point wasting time on, uh, on stocks that don't have enough options liquidity if you're doing an options play. And SHW, if you look to on this, um, this little um, matrix here and all the way to the right, Okay, I have the open interest. That's the open interest for all the options chains uh, within the ticker. And SHW has pretty much almost double the open interest of the other two. So that's the one that we'll focus on. Now, clearly, um, yeah, we'll also have to make sure that fundamentally, you know, the that support that supports that bearish view. But we're going to get to that in a sec. So anyway, Sherwin Williams. It's a bigger company, okay? It's $57.5 billion market cap. It's in the S&P 500. So it kind of fits into that larger cap, more mature space that we like to look at uh, when it comes to shorts. And, uh, and last quarter, the company reported results below expectations. They missed both top and bottom line estimates, cut their guidance. And they're also having kind of ish big issues really with the supply chain that is still going on, especially in this kind of chemical space. So they have, uh, you know, dealing with house paints and whatnot, they rely a lot on getting other chemicals, um, you know, to get this, you know, to get this product made, done. And, uh, and they're having a hell of a time trying to find that. So not gonna go too deep into the weeds here, okay, for the fundamental company specific stuff. I mean, you know, this is more of a macro play and, uh, you know, we're not Warren Buffett's holding a stock for decades. So I'm going to focus on what's important, keep it clean, and uh, not let this drag out too long. But, uh, you know, we're just trying to make some money over the next few months. We're not buying out the company. But what I do like to look at is the 
consensus earnings per share revisions trend. So this kind of has the opposite picture of post where there's been a negative trend uh, pretty much across across the board. Um, this you know after the after the stock uh, missed both sales and earnings per share estimates last quarter, and uh, we have next earnings in a month's time. But anyway, the forward-looking consensus revisions uh, for earnings per share has been you know cranked lower on for uh, one and three and the six month time period. So let's have a look at, again, I like to look at the chart. So we're gonna look at that. In this case, I have a weekly chart of SHW and I have the revenue, which is that cyan color on there as well as earnings. Okay, now these are trailing figures, keep that in mind. But the reason I had this on is kind of point out where you see revenue has actually been climbing quite nicely. All right. And, uh, but earnings really peaked um, a while ago and the stock has been falling ever since. So the margins here are being squeezed. And a lot of that has to do with the cost of their uh, uh, supplies, you know, getting just crazy expensive. So, and also now just, you know, basic price action stuff. You have, uh, you know, kind of a bigger picture of lower highs and lower lows, which is the very definition of a downturn. So moving on to the options chain, uh, since I'm kind of thinking about this as a pair trade with Post, uh, Post had a cost of uh, about $2,400, okay? And it was structured in October and December. So I'm gonna do the same thing here, more or less, just using puts. So SHW was at 219 last and the December 210 out of the money puts, uh, they have a nice tight spread uh, on the mid price is 990. And uh, they, are, they are a little bit out of the money, but since we are in a bear market technically and stocks tend to fall faster than they climb, um, I think that should work out well here. So buying three December 210 puts at 990 uses a total spend of $2,970 selling three of the October 200s um, puts that is at 270 gives us a credit of 810. So the total spend will be $2,160, which is fairly close at a $2,415 spend on post. And um, you know, this expires the same time. And uh, with this trade structure, it's uh, again, open-ended profit potential should the whole market unravel, especially after the Fed meet today, we'll see what happens there. And um, so, yeah, so this is an example of really a pairs trade, but these two trade ideas can very well stand on their own. It's just that because of what's happening in the market, it kind of makes sense to be market agnostic at this point. So that's pretty much a wrap from what I have here. For sure, yeah. Uh, definitely a good point on on kind of staying agnostic in the portfolio at the moment. That's something we always talk about on here is is having a balance of being long and short in any in any environment. Um, excellent, gents. We'll wrap it up there. Uh, thank you both for coming on the show today, talking about you know the current market environment and of course those ideas that you mentioned. Um, definitely really interesting thoughts to kind of take away for everyone. Now, for those of you watching, uh, if you enjoyed that, you'll enjoy the other content that we have available on our website, itpm.com. We've got webinars and seminars coming up. You can check out um, when those are on the website and we've got uh, educational courses, we've got mentoring and so on. There's, there's something up there for all of you guys. Uh, so do check out our website for more information on that. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing some of you guys within the Institute uh, in the near future, but for now, uh, we've finished the episode and we look forward to seeing you next time on another episode of What's On Your Mind.